And as we said, ask any questions. Doesn't matter how you ask it, just ask it. Don't worry about offending us, don't worry about any kind of judgment. This is like our little space that we hope you actually ask what's on your mind. And even if it's not on your mind, maybe something you've heard or something that others are concerned about, about Islam or Muslims, whether it has to do with the videos or not, please ask them on those index cards and get them turned in so we can get a lot of uh, questions and hopefully a really good engaging conversation. And so before that, Pastor Elias Seen is going um, to ask us a few questions just to kind of get us started. And so take it away, brother. So it's mid, well, not midweek, it's the beginning of the week, it's Tuesday, there's a lot going on. But it seems like it's important for you that we take some time to do this kind of event. Um, why, why do you think events like this are important? And why would... Why would we carve a time to make a space for that, these kind of events? So the very first thing I want to remind us all is that 50% of the population in the United States is chronically lonely. And so what happens to us when we're chronically lonely is we begin to fear everyone. But we still want some noise happening in the house, so what do we do? We turn on the TV or we, we look up stuff on Google, we start watching YouTube or whatever it is we do. And mostly what we're going to hear in those contexts are negative things about other people. And then we know that right now we have in this country a, a hate industry, an anti-Muslim hate industry that spends 30 to $40 million a year spreading negative messages about Islam. We know that we have news coverage, that, that, that whenever there's religious coverage, 50% of the time it's about Muslims, and only 5% of that time is it positive. And so the reality is all of us are, are in a media environment, many of us are lonely, we're in a media environment that tells us only negative stories. And what I've found is that when we sit down across the table from, from people, and we look them in the eye and we start sharing some stories, well all of a sudden all that media stuff doesn't matter anymore because we have a real human connection. And isn't that in fact what a lot of us and a lot of people in our country are longing for? I think that was a fantastic answer. Um, the only thing that I would add, oh, thank you. other than just saying ditto to what my dear brother said, uh, is just the reality that in this sort of hustle and bustle of life, I know we are all so busy, and there are so many different causes, it seems, that we could be addressing or working on. So I get it. It is a, a commitment to come out, and that's why we appreciate you giving us the gift of your time and being here with us this evening. What I would say as to sort of why it's important is because we are facing a very critical time in our nation's history. And I believe, you know, as bad as things may be, I personally believe that it is an amazing time to be alive because we have more power today than ever in my lifetime to really make a change on the issues that matter and to also collectively decide the future direction and soul of our country. I firmly believe that. And I think if we don't take the time to show up for these kinds of events and be there to learn about each other and build the connections, the real human relationships with each other and learn from each other, if we don't do that, that we could be missing an opportunity, a significant opportunity that could allow for further divisiveness and could allow our country to go in a direction that could be detrimental to us all. I tell this to people all the time, the anti-Muslim rhetoric and sentiment and policies and proposals and actions in our country does not just hurt me as a Muslim. It hurts every single one of us as Americans. And if you think about something, the population of American Muslims in our country today is roughly equivalent to the population of our Jewish siblings in 1930s Germany when they were also going through this kind of dehumanization machinery and this whole sort of uh, industry, this hate industry that was spreading lies and conspiracy theories and misinformation and you were seeing the start of what we're seeing today as well happening then. I think it's incumbent on us and we actually have the opportunity to make sure that never again holds true for all and that we collectively change the course of our history in a positive direction. So I actually think, even if this might seem like a small commitment or you know, just a one night, how can I make a difference in one night? I actually firmly believe that this is how we make a difference. Coming together in community, in you know, gatherings like this, 
That's how we change the world. That's how we ensure that our country's future is a kind of future that is gonna be beneficial for all of us and one that upholds the fairness and dignity and respect for all and makes sure we never do something that we will regret as a nation again. Why have you decided to gear this kind of gathering around stories and not just do a bunch of list of facts or, you know, like online, you got these listicles that give you like top 10 things. Why stories? Want to go first? Okay, um, because facts and stats don't change hearts and minds. I have all the facts and stats. I could sit there and debate with any, you know, sort of anti Muslim bigot out there. I could counter everything they say with all the facts on any of the issues they raise. I'm an attorney by, by practice, just like that. <laughs> so I would actually love that opportunity, okay? But here's the reality. <laughs> no, that's, I mean that's a compliment. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. I was churning in my head. Okay. No, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. I'm a recovering attorney. How's that? I love my career. I left my legal career to do this kind of work, okay? So really, like, I could debate, but it doesn't work. It doesn't matter, the facts and stats, they, like studies show us that if you debate people and you give them facts and stats, what that actually does is that further reinforces their position sometimes. So it could actually be detrimental. But you know what works is the human stories. Because nobody can debate stories. When you share those human, personalizing, positive stories with each other, nobody can argue with you on that. And it moves us away from that emotional realm of arguing and being right to a place where we can actually open up to hearing each other and connecting at a human level. And we've seen example after example of people who are fundamentally transformed, including people who've attacked Muslims or attacked mosques or people who hated Muslims and preached against Muslims from the pulpit even, who completely transform and now have loving relationships and stand in solidarity. And in fact, they're living out their faith values, whatever their faith tradition may be. So we've seen the power, and what I always, the one advice I always give people is to not debate people who argue about some of these issues. You know, don't debate theology, don't have those uncomfortable Thanksgiving meal dinners where somebody feels like they want to walk away. Don't do those. Instead, if you hear somebody say an anti-Muslim comment, just say, you know what? That's not true. Let me tell you about the Muslim Zion. And then just go into positive stories, and all of a sudden it's an entirely different emotional uh, space and people just are impacted differently than they are if you gave them a bunch of facts and stats and data and information. So Imam uh, Jamal Rahman, a wonderful Imam and also an interfaith leader in our region, says that the universe is not made of atoms, it's made of stories. So when you share your positive story, what does that do? It rearranges someone universe, someone's universe. It may not do it immediately, it may be just that little thing that helps someone realize that maybe their bigotry and their hatred or even their fears are maybe not fully justified and that maybe they want to learn more. So there is always a question about, well, there's not always, but I've countered a question about gender issues in the Muslim community. So. Um, could you say something about Islam and women? I think I should talk about that first. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning it over to Anila. <laughs> like, that should have gone to you, but uh, <laughs> give me the question. <laughs> okay, women's rights and Islam. Let me put it this way. Uh, I actually love talking about this, and I could spend all the evening just on this topic. It's actually one of my favorite topics to talk about because I personally chose Islam in large part because of the empowerment of women through the Quran, when I did a comparative analysis of religion. So, so that was my own decision. Uh, and I will say that a lot of people are surprised to hear that. They're often very surprised to hear that, given a lot of the misinformation and the stereotypes that they may have about Islam or women, uh, Muslim women. Uh, but this, 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 uh, some of the facts that I'll just share very quickly, because again, I could go all night on this. 1400 years ago, Islam, uh, the Quran, introduced a package of women's rights 
that was simply unparalleled at that time and for generations to come in many other places. This included the right to own your own property, the right to inheritance, the right to enter into a contract on your own, the right to choose who you want to marry, the right to divorce, the right to child custody, the right to uh, uh, support, the right to education, the right to participate publicly. There are so many rights that people are just are even surprised to hear that. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, he went to women for advice, he appointed women to positions of power. He said the birth of a girl is a blessing at a time when he didn't need to say that about boys because that was already uh, accepted as a blessing, but girls were not. He elevated sort of the value of girls. He elevated the value of uh, wives. He told his followers, the best of you are those who treat your women well. He elevated the value of mothers. He said paradise lies at the feet of your mother. He taught his followers things like, you know, one, one person, uh, one time he told this one one gentleman that if you he had that person had four daughters he said if you raise your four daughters well and educate them that could be your pathway to paradise and one guy was there and was like hey what about me i only have three daughters and muhammad was like okay even you with your three daughters if you raise and educate them well that could be your pathway to paradise he appointed people to put women to positions of power including something like the equivalent of the minister of finance today this was the market, the supervisor of the marketplace. Um, he sort of really uh, uh, sought to uh, empower and liberate women at a time when they were not as empowered or liberated uh, 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 in society, generally speaking. And he did all of that, and it had a profound impact on history thereafter, to the point that there were women scholars throughout history. In fact, there was one person who went out to do a, a little book on sort of the women, female, the female Muslim scholars. And this person thought he'd have like, you know, 25, 30 examples that he'd write about in a book. He ended up having a 40 volume series to write about Muslim female scholars in history. And these are not just people who are sort of, you know, writing books from their homes or whatever. No, no, no. These are people who are teaching women and men. These were women who were issuing legal rulings. These were women who were helping define the parameters of the religion for folks. These were people who were active participants in society as judges, as, you know, many other roles as well. Um, and even in modern history, we have women uh, in Muslim-majority countries who have been heads of state, who have had other roles as well that are very sort of uh, powerful roles. And this is something that Islam came to liberate everybody, including women. Unfortunately, what we see happening today in many countries, including Muslim-majority countries, unfortunately, and it's not unique to Muslim-majority countries, we have it everywhere, sadly, is a problem with the patriarchy and misogyny. And I actually personally believe that Muhammad, peace be upon him, would roll in his grave, a grave if he saw what some of the people were doing in the name of religion uh, today to women. Because that completely contradicts what he came to sort of introduce through the Quran, which we believe is a direct revelation from God. And, and sort of it's just what I tell people constantly is the, so the misogyny or oppression that you might see in certain places is not because of Islamic teachings, but rather despite Islamic teachings. And it's in fact a return to some of the pre-Islamic sort of ignorance that existed at that time. So Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of what? Someone else's eye, right? So we have to recognize that Jesus uh, risked his life to have Mary sit at his feet, which meant that she was an official disciple and could therefore become a rabbi when women were not allowed to teach in public. Uh, how long has it taken Christian denominations or Christian tradition to have female pastors? Are there, are there Christian countries or people who use Christianity to justify a misogyny and oppression of women? So of course there are. And so, but the issue is that we only hear about countries or situations where, where there is misogyny. So recognize that there's a difference between the policies and laws of a nation state, right? And the, the religion uh, of that, the primary religion of that country and different, different traditions within that and different cultural inter, uh, appreciations of how to live out that religion. So sometimes when we think about Islam or we think about some, some religion with which we're not terribly familiar, we lump it all into one big bucket. And that really is not fair. That's called collective blame when we do that. And it's just not actually accurate to what Islam is or how Muslims live. Another of those buckets that 
based on the on the media we consume is violence. Right? There is this whole notion of um, Islam being um, a violent religion. What does Islam teach us about peace? I'm happy to go first. Or people? You go first. Okay. So this is another question that we get a lot of, and if you actually look at studies, again, the statistics, the facts versus the misinformation or the uh, stereotype, um, uh, very clearly in our country, the biggest threat on our soil, on our country's soil, is not from people who look like me, or my brother, or my father. It's generally more like people who look like my dear brother, <laughs> right? White men. Statistically, that's a fact. But people are not scared of white men as a group. Right? Why is that? It's because of media, it's because of, of our perception of who is a threat and sort of how certain groups are portrayed and when something happens, the kind of associated group blame that goes with it that other categories of the group, white men in particular, are not subject to. So that affects everybody's perception of sort of violence. But I will say that what Islam teaches specifically is about peace. Like the word Islam itself has the same root as peace and the idea is that in, in, it also means the sort of submission to God's will. Uh, and actually, Muslims believe that all the prophets, peace be upon them all, from because we believe in all of them, from Adam to Abraham to Noah to David to Moses to Jesus, peace be upon them all, we believe they all submitted their will to God because they did what God wanted, not what their own personal desires or egos might have wanted. So we actually believe they're all Muslims with a lowercase n. Right, like people who submitted their will to God, which is the technical definition of, of Muslim. But we believe that they submit their will to God and God wants us to pursue peace. And the way we achieve peace is by sort of calling or answering that higher calling to do good, to put our sort of uh, God's, uh, what, what he asks of us, you know, peace, mercy, love, compassion, justice, the very same things that all of our faith traditions teach us especially all the Abrahamic faith traditions, we believe that those are the very same teachings that God asks of all of us to pursue in our everyday life. And we achieve peace within ourselves and the people and the environment around us. We are in harmony when we actually submit to what God wants in terms of wanting to achieve these higher values, these higher principles. And sort of the, the teachings throughout the Quran are exactly about that. You know, Islamic teachings are very much emphasizing the very same teachings at their core that Jesus, peace be upon him, taught as the two greatest commandments. And he was quoting the Torah, you know, when he was talking about that, which is essentially to love and worship one God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the, the very, you know, two teachings of Jesus at their core that are the most important, the greatest commandments. That's also what Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught. In fact, he taught us that you cannot truly have faith until you love one another. And that is the very essence, that's the, the core, the golden rule essentially, is what all faith traditions teach us. And then specifically with Islam, there is the permission to engage in self-defense. You know, and that, that uh, permission did not come until much, much later. So for 13 years, when the Muslim community was in Mecca, because the Quran was revealed over the course of 23 years, for 13 years in Mecca, while the Muslim community lived there, they did not have the permission even for self-defense. They were being persecuted and literally tortured in really horrific ways that I will not describe, especially because we have some kids here. You know, the really horrific ways that the community was being tortured, they were not even allowed to engage in self-defense, engage in sort of, you know, that kind of physical confrontation for self-defense. When they finally migrated, they fled the persecution and went to Medina, when they were there, they were still not allowed to live freely, and uh, their, uh, their property was being stolen by the, the Meccans who were in Mecca and being sold off. When they were still harassed and being persecuted, then finally, the second year in Medina, the commandment came down, allowing them, for the first time, to engage in physical confrontation for self-defense. And the whole teachings of Islam are to protect sort of yourself or other people, to allow for religious freedom. There are very strict limitations around when you can even engage in any kind of violence. Um, and it really is in a way to achieve peace and freedom for all, not in any way about violence. So it really is a teaching of peace even in that context. It's to end persecution or harm to people or yourself. And that's the specific context in which it's allowed. Otherwise, it is not. And that commandment even came later. And I can go into many more stories, but I'll stop for a moment there. Yeah, just to say that human, the violence is a human potential and a human problem. 
You know, there's no culture that has not had some expression of it. We know from studies and from historians that, that the conditions that create human violence tend to be ones in which human rights and human futures are being denied. And so we, we know that, that in situations where human rights and human potentiality is denied, that we're going to see some violence. And then what happens is that people begin to turn to whatever tradition is around, whether it's Christianity or, or Buddhism, as is happening right now in Myanmar and to Sri Lanka to some degree. Some people will try to use religion to justify their violence. So it's important to say that the Prophet Muhammad lived 24,000 days, roughly. Of those 24,000 days, how many days did he engage in any kind of defensive warfare? Six. How many of those days were spent in offensive warfare? Zero. So if, in fact, Islam is uniquely, profoundly you know, producing violence, well then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not a very good Muslim. What's happened is we're telling a selective story in our nation, in our media, and often by churches, about who's violent and who's not, in a way that is itself promoting violence. We need to, all, we need to hold all people who do violence accountable for the violence they do, but we should not apply collective blame to a whole group when we see a few members of it justifying their violence on the basis of a twisted and distorted interpretation of it. Is Islam compatible with democracy? Is it my turn to move? Oh, I think it's my turn. Okay. So Islam teaches that, um, that uh, um, you have to obey the law of the land in which you live. That is actually part of Sharia, which is a kind of a, a word that's used to describe the sum total of Islamic teachings. And in a book that came out in 2008, What, what a Billion Muslims Really Think, the, the authors found through doing demographic research and studies that the vast majority of Muslims love America and love the U.S. Constitution because it gives in an in a, in a 18th century way, what a lot of what the Quran and Sharia itself teaches, that there should be religious freedom, and rights for, for women, and rights for men, and uh, the children should be educated, and everybody should have food, and all these, kinds of, all these kind of teachings, and that there can be religious pluralism. So the Quran itself and the, the, the Muslim tradition, Islamic tradition, teaches uh, religious freedom, that there shall be no compulsion in religion. But there are hate groups out there that want to get a little Jedi mind trick going in us. They want to claim that Muslims want to take away everybody else's civil liberties and religious freedom. And so therefore, we should go ahead and take away Muslims' civil liberties and religious freedom. And what that does, friends, even though it feels kind of right emotionally, it's actually logically really crazy. And what that would do if we allow them to lead us astray is to reduce the civil rights of every American. Because if you reduce the rights of one American, what do you do to the rest? You reduce them. So we need to resist this pull that is based on kind of a, an unconscious and really um, overblown fear. Um, I think you already answered really well the question about Islam and democracy, and that's certainly true. Uh, what I will just add about a little bit more, because this is the context in which usually people have this concern or this question, and that has to do with Sharia. So we already had Brother Terry already describe it a little bit. I just want to go a little bit deeper into that. So Sharia itself simply means Islamic teachings. The word is an Arabic word, and this is how the hate industry works. They'll take a word that nobody knows, and then they'll ascribe a meaning that they want to ascribe to it that engenders fear in people, right? And they'll come up with all these really horrible things and say, this is what it is, when in fact that's not at all what the billion plus Muslims in the world think of when they think of Islamic teachings. Sharia is simply things like me uh, you know, being kind to my parents, or repelling evil with good, as the Quran commands, or showing kindness to my, uh, to my neighbors, or you know, praying. Uh, or giving in charity. These are all part of Islamic teachings. And that's what Sharia is. Li linguistically, the word refers to a path. 
And the idea is that just as animals are thirsty and they have a path to water, we as human beings are spiritually thirsty. And Sharia is a, a path for us to achieve that spiritual fulfillment for our spiritual thirst. That's really what it is. And the idea is that there is no like one book of Sharia. You can't like find a book that says this is what it is. Because the concept of what Islamic teachings are have changed over the course of history, have changed based on which school of thought you're asking. You know, there is no one specific thing that is Sharia. And the person who's behind this whole anti-Sharia movement, because it is a movement, the person who's behind it, he himself basically admitted that he didn't care if these laws, because there's actually laws in certain states that have been introduced in many states that are anti-Sharia, which are really anti-Muslim bills. These bills have passed in certain states. And unfortunately, um, and he even admitted that if they were just passed, that wouldn't be enough. Like he didn't care if they were passed or not, because everybody knows there's no real threat. In our country, the US Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and no law, foreign or otherwise, can sort of uh, be supreme over our US Constitution. That's just a matter of fact. The American Bar Association and other lawyers, and myself as a lawyer, can affirm that for you. That's just a matter of fact. But what he admitted is like, essentially what he was wanting to achieve is people to be talking about this issue. Because talking about it and building up that fear and the concern, like that was his real intention. It wasn't about the safety or security of our Constitution, which is entirely safe from any you know, sort of threat uh, in terms of other laws, right? That that's just a matter of fact. But he wanted to engender that fear, and that's what we've achieved now, unfortunately, where people are scared of this and they spread anti-Muslim beliefs as a result. When in fact, what I tell people, and I say this as a lawyer too, is if you are trying to infringe on my right as an American Muslim to freely practice my faith, that you're actually the one who's trampling on our constitutional values, not, not you know, me or Sharia. Like that's actually a direct violation and undercutting of our US Constitution when people deprive any you know, religious minority person of their right to religious freedom, one of the freedoms on which our country was built. And at the same time, what I tell people is Sharia and the US Constitution are entirely compatible in the sense that there are elements, as Reverend Terry mentioned, that directly correlate. And in fact, if you ask many Muslims, they will tell you that one of the best places where you can practice Islam is in America because we have religious freedom here. And that's exactly what Sharia commands, is to have, allow people that choice of faith. Because that's what essentially Islam teaches us this life is all about. That we are taught that in this life we are being tested. And all, all of our deeds and actions are being recorded, good and bad. And on Judgment Day we will be judged on those actions and, and deeds and you know, what things we said. And if you do not have a choice in saying or doing those things, and you are forced to do anything, then somebody is taking away your freedom, your choice, your free will, and they are therefore making this test of faith, this test of life, completely irrelevant for you. Because you will then not be judged on it. So it goes against the very core essence of Islam uh, to, to sort of you know, take away religious freedom from people. Sir, you mentioned the phrase um, religious pluralism, and, um, and now, Anila, you mentioned this idea of religious freedom and religious practice. What does Islam teach us about other faith and other religions? Well, the key, the key is that Islam sees itself as, an, as a continuation of the larger Abrahamic tradition. So, um, so it began with, with Judaism, but there are, there's the Druze are also an Abrahamic tradition. Um, Certainly, Christianity is, a, is part of the Abrahamic tradition, and Islam is as well. And it sees a line of prophets beginning with with um, with Adam, and all the way through all the prophets um, who are speaking truth to human beings in their own context. Right. So the prophets are sent into a specific context to help call people to two basic things. One is love of God more than your tribe and tradition. In other words. We're called to see and recognize other human beings as human because there's one creator who made all of us. And so even though we may be different, you know, the, those, those differences are actually gifts that God has given. And then number two, of course, is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the word love doesn't mean to have warm feelings. It means to work for the well-being of your neighbor. 
And so, and so um, it's, from the very beginning, Islam understood that, that, that Judaism and Christianity and other monotheistic faiths are awesome and they should be protected um, when there's a Muslim majority country and respect it. Islam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad had nine spouses and that's a whole complicated topic itself because remember King David had how many wives? <laughs> something like 800, right? Something like that. So, so, but he cared about all of them. And two of them were Jewish, and he, he said, you know, if you want to remain faithful to your Jewish tradition, feel free to do that. Two of them were Christian. He said, if you want to remain faithful to Christianity, please go ahead and do that. So Islam grew in a, in a pluralistic, multi-faith context, and in fact honored and celebrated that. And I'll just add that specifically in the Quran, uh, Jews and Christians are recognized and referred to by a very honorific title, uh, People of the Book. And the idea is that they've also had other prophets sent to them, and they are learned people, you know, people who've had religious revelation and scripture given to them. And that is a, a, a way of showing esteem. And in fact, the Quran tells Muslims that if you don't know something, go ask the people before you, go ask the people who know. Um, and even encourages us as Muslims, we are encouraged in Islam to know and read prior revelation because we believe in it. We believe in the Torah that was given to Moses, peace be upon him. We believe in uh, you know, the Psalms that were given to David, peace be upon him. We believe in the, the Injil or gospel given to Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe in all of that. And because we believe in all of that, we should, we're supposed to show you know, respect and love and unity. And the idea is also uh, that in sort of Muslim majority countries, people who are following those faith traditions are supposed to be protected. This is why you have throughout Islamic history certain rulers who even helped protect or uh, sort of rebuild certain uh, Jewish and Christian uh, places of worship. You know, there, there was a story even of, of one ruler who was at a church one time and, um, and, and prayer time showed up, you know, the Muslim prayer time. And he, he was going to go outside to pray, and the, the church leaders were like, oh, you can pray here. And he's like, no, no, I don't want to pray here, because I don't want people in the future to think that because I prayed here that this should become a Muslim place of worship. I want to preserve it as a Christian place of worship. So he went outside and prayed. There are stories like that throughout the history, and there are some beautiful traditions, and even Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, he entered into covenants with certain Christian monks, uh, certain communities there, or with certain Jewish communities, where he even told them that he's going to protect them, and he did. And he even put a commandment on all Muslims to protect them until the end of times. And he even had some sort of powerful uh, teachings where he said one time that anybody who basically uh, uh, oppresses a, a minority community within a Muslim majority land, a religious minority community, anybody who oppresses that kind of community, that he, that I, meaning Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, that I will testify against such oppressor on the day of judgment. That's how strong the teaching was. And this is why there's a movement now, uh, thank God, that, that I think is much needed, uh, for uh, uh, a lot of Muslim majority countries came together relatively recently, a couple years ago, and even had a conference in Morocco uh, that they sort of directly looked at these covenants of the Prophet. And they talked about how do we need to be changing certain policies or procedures in certain Muslim majority lands in order to uphold and respect the very teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Quran about upholding minority rights. So that says a little bit more about what Islam teaches about other faith traditions. We'll move on to some of the some of the questions, a few of the questions. We won't get we'll get a chance to go through them all, but we'll we'll go through some. Um, so what who is the Muslim hating industry that Kyle mentioned? Yeah, so um, a study, a research which was done from by Berkeley University, by Berkeley, um, Southern California, Berkeley, and they found that there were 34 anti-Muslim hate groups that were the primary core of what they called the Islamophobia industry. So these are groups that have like moms for apple pie sort of uh, names like so act for america is one of the largest ones that's the group that did the the 23 uh, uh anti-sharia demonstrations around the country two years ago there's another group called uh, the center for security policy um secretary of state mike pompeo um, has been on their radio show over and over again secretary of state mike pompeo 
won an award in 2016 from Act for America. And he's our Secretary of State. And so these 34 groups do a lot of work. They do messaging, they do YouTube videos, they do all kinds of work. Um, uh, and, and, their, and their voice is amplified by a lot of Christian pastors, including some in this community, who brought in an, an active anti-Muslim hate group speaker in 2014. It's, you can still find it on YouTube. And, uh, and so th these 34 hate groups across the country are then amplified by Christian speakers, they're amplified by certain media sources, and when President Donald Trump stood up about you know, three years ago now and held up this study after he called for a total and complete shutdown of all Muslims coming into the country, it was a bogus study done by the Center for Security Policy that had no scientific validity. So these folk are actively engaged, spending lots of money, connected to the halls of power, getting some funding, quite a bit of their funding actually, from people who own stock in, in military and defense uh, businesses. Because they believe that it's more important to have an enemy so they can sell weapons than it is to tell the truth. And what happens as the result of that is that 42% of Muslim kids in this country are bullied at least once a year in school, and 25% of the time those students are bullied by teachers or administrators. So the hate groups are having an impact not only on people's attitudes toward Muslims, but toward the way, the way individuals relate to them, the way institutions treat Muslims, and the way systems in our country actively behave toward Muslims. So when my Muslim friend went through the border and they saw his name was Muhammad, after he was kept there for quite a while, they came back and said, you know, we checked you out, you're okay, but you should really consider changing your name. And that's from a trained border guard. So these hate groups have, have really precipitated and created an incredible rise since about 2008 in anti-Muslim bigotry in this country. And we know where that kind of dehumanizing speech leads. Whether it's about Muslims or about immigrants or refugees or any other group of people, we know that it leads to increased violence. And that's why we have to stand together against it. And I will just add that you can go to islamophobianetwork.com or islamophobia.org to find the, you know, all of these different groups identified. Uh, again, the core, it's, there's so many amplifiers of their message. But if you go to, again, www.islamophobia, that's I-S-L-A-M-O-P-H-O-B-I-A dot org. So www.islamophobia.org or www.islamophobianetwork.com. Uh, that will get you introduced to some of who these specific groups and specific uh, individuals are. And again, just the core. Felt like I was in a stone league. <laughs> that was impressive. Third grade. <laughs> Why are Christians infidels? I would say they're not, to begin with. Uh, so the, this, there is this conception that people perpetuate about Christians being something, uh, and the word that they use that, that specifically uh, in this context, as you mentioned, is, is that word. Um, I personally don't even like that word. Uh, as I described, uh, the Christians and Jews are described as people of the book. They're treated with honor and respect, uh, not in this kind of negative way. That word, uh, the, the Arabic is kafir, and that is specifically referring to the Meccans who are persecuting uh, the Muslim community. That's who God is talking about when he's talking about this idea of those you know, kinds of people who were not allowing the Muslim community to be able to exercise religious freedom. It's not talking about everybody who isn't Muslim. That's not at all the case, and it certainly isn't the case for Christians and Jews who are considered people of the book. Yeah, so uh, let's just put this in real practical terms. Anybody here have a time machine? Yeah. Okay, then you can't be an infidel. Right? You'd also have to be able to change your genetic makeup to be part of a tribe of people uh, in 7th century Arabia, and you would have to actively have oppressed people, and you would have been unwilling to repent of it. 
Does any here, anybody here meet those qualifications? I do. <laughs> Pastor Doug, thank you very much. So the reality is that, that no one here, so there are some passages in every holy book that are universal. There are a lot of passages that are very specific to a context. That is specific to a context. Later on, some scholar got paid a little bit of money, maybe under the table, by a king to apply that term more broadly. But in mainstream Islam, that is, not, that is understood to not be a faithful interpretation of that specific contextual word. But it brings up a lot of fear. So remember, the KKK, does it represent all Christianity? So let's don't hate, let's don't allow, you know, up groups in other countries who do violence to represent all of Islam with their distortions of it. I made a good segue to the next question is, within the Muslim community, is there a group that has the same prejudice toward other Americans? Say that one more time. Within the Muslim community, is there a group that has the same prejudice toward other Americans? The same prejudice as, as what? Are there Muslims that are prejudiced against other Americans? Oh, absolutely. There are, I think, prejudiced people in every community, unfortunately. Um, is there a specific group that identifies themselves a certain way that you could say that's the group that's prejudiced? I don't think so. Not, not that I'm familiar with within the American Muslim community. Uh, but I certainly know that within every community, there are some who are more tolerant uh, and there are others who are less tolerant, unfortunately. I was talking to some people before, before we started here, and one of the things we were saying is how we, and I will apply this to everybody in this room, we all in this room have far more in common with each other than any one of you individually has with certain fringe elements of your faith community or that I have with fringe elements of my faith community. That's a matter of fact. And I think it's incumbent upon us as people of, of good faith, as people of good, to try to bring and amplify that message, our message of unity and solidarity and loving your neighbors as, as yourselves, instead of allowing the other narrative that certain people within the Christian community hold, that certain people within the Muslim community hold, or the Jewish community, or the secular community, whatever it may be, I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that our voices and our message and our narrative is far stronger than the haters. Amen. One more? Sure. One more? Sure. Make it real tough. Make it, awesome. make it a tough one. A tough, a tough one. <laughs> um, so how involved are the male Muslims in this movement? Uh, this movement of interfaith work or the movement of what? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Okay. Um, I would say that the Muslim men are as involved as the Muslim women, um, sort of at a national level. Uh, I think Muslim women tend to be more visible if they wear a head covering, so they're often seen more visibly. I think women's bodies are given far more attention, generally speaking, than male bodies. So anytime women, Muslim women in particular, are in a certain place, they are given far more attention than the Muslim men who may show up, um, and that could be because they might not be as strongly visible um, as the Muslim women. Um, I will also say that a lot of folks often are surprised that they know a Muslim because they're a doctor or they're a dentist or you know somebody is a Muslim and they just never knew because they never had identified themselves that way, and I think that's very true. Uh, but besides the visibility point, I think there are American Muslim men and women who are very active on this front of trying to achieve reconciliation, trying to build bridges of understanding and unity, um, and I think uh, we need to work with sort of whoever is out there willing to work on this. I, having said that, and looking at this room and seeing very few, if any, um, male Muslims in the room, I will say that we do need more Muslim men to get more involved. So I'm saying this to the live stream audience watching. Uh, and then we do have Heidi here, who is our awesome representative. Yeah. So we don't sit <laughs> But we do need more uh, Muslim men to be actively involved, absolutely. Uh, they are involved in other ways, but oftentimes they are not as involved as they should be, from my perspective, in a lot of this kind of work. So at, at, I speak with, uh, with Imam Adam Jamal from the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, and also Rabbi Johanna Kinberg um, with the Tracy Levine Center's uh, Interfaith Week at Holden Village. And so, you know, Adam's been a really big, a big, uh, big partner, a good partner for me in this work. 
um, as have a number of other Muslim speakers um, who are male. Part of the challenge that we have in Western Washington is that there's not just conservative Islamophobia, there's also liberal or progressive Islamophobia that, that, that tends to be sort of anti-religious and also tends to believe to, you know, very quickly um, that Islam <coughs> uniquely somehow teaches oppression of women. And so one of the ways to counter that is when we see a strong, powerful, like intelligent, funny person like Anila stand up and I mean, I mean in the humorous way, not in the, not in the so, uh, sorry about that. So, um, I didn't, that, sometimes things don't come out the way you intend, right? So, so when, we, when we see Anila or other speakers, they kind of realize that their progressive sort of liberal Islamophobia is kind of silly, right? But, but we do have many men who are doing really excellent work. And another interfaith leader that I mentioned earlier is Imam Jamal Rahman who's, who's uh, one of the leaders of the Interfaith uh, Community Sanctuary in Seattle. So there's a deep interfaith kind of public leadership movement as he and, uh, and a rabbi and a pastor have gone out and, and spoken with the, the, as the three amigos for many, many years now. So just, it's just tonight that you're seeing you know, primarily 